Good evening. Welcome to the studio this evening. And on tonight's show. <laughs> um, sorry, I can't remember what that's. It's a UK television program. That was, I'm sure that was from on tonight's show. But I can't remember which. But it just strikes me as being something that I recall hearing on there. We're going to carry on with the 3D printer. This is the um, x-axis carriage in front of us here. Or in front of me. And um, one of the next part about this is adding in the x-axis motor which sits in here and then the belt drive for the x-axis which is the one that goes crosswise. So we're going to start by getting out parts with uh, starting with an x-axis motor I guess. Now then uh, I wonder if that's just in the box loose. It probably is. Back in a moment. Yeah, that's one of the motors that's loose, as opposed to the ones that are in the extruder bags. So that's an x-axis motor, and that's probably in here is probably the uh, the motor, the cogwheel for it, and. I need an M3, two M3 washers and two M3 16 cap screws. Uh, so M3 washers. Okay, big bag. M3 16s. Ugh, get them out, otherwise I'm sure I'll leave the one that I want will be the one that gets left in the bag. Um, M3 10s, M3 8s, M2.5 M3 countersunk. They're certainly not it. The M5. M3 nylock. Two and a half nuts. Two and a half washers. M3 washers. I'm going to want some of those. M5 nylock. M three twenties, M three nuts. Don't need nuts about no I will because they get screwed into the motor. M five nuts, M five washers, M three sixteens. Last bag. <laughs> oh, it would have been the last bag I looked at anyway, wouldn't it? Right. So I want two of these. And I want two washers. This is going to be a fairly simple job, is this one? Put those nuts back in the big bag. And two of the washers. It, in some ways, this feels like I'm almost done, and the other feels it's like I'm a long way away because I've got still got loads of bags of stuff. Because there's all the electronics to do as well. This is just the mechanical assembly at the moment. But one, two, and hopefully I wake up because I am feeling tired. I was dropping asleep once I've had my tea, which wasn't a great idea because it gives me migraine headaches. Um, right, I figured I'd need to uh, file that because. Again, the end gets squished. So, we'll have a flat and we'll have a round. Actually, I'll also probably grab. Don't do that over the bearings, that way I don't get dust in the bearings. So, this is just to take off the squishing bit. So the hole isn't a perfect size because it's been squished slightly by the manufacturing process. And I've now got this uh, oval just to get into the corners there. So 
So outside of this I have been busy, or I am busy, um, getting some videos prepped for to go onto YouTube. I had to do them about twice. Because the first time the videos were corrupt. So I'm getting quite good at, uh, at quick editing the, uh, the videos. So there's nothing fancy about them, I'm just basically doing the same thing to each one, and taking a long video and splitting it up. So rather than going onto YouTube with an hour and a half long, it's going up on uh, or will be going up in about half hour segments. There we go. So that's on there. And yeah, when you, when you put this on, one end has got the D shape on it, the other end is round. Quite clever how they've transitioned between the two, but the round end you put on first just because it makes it easy. Um, I am sure that I put this on doesn't particularly say. Shaft, yeah. About a millimeter. Okay, so I'll do that by eye. That's about a millimeter. Interestingly, these uh, stepper motors also make good generators. If you do that, you can actually get quite a reasonable amount of uh, power out of them. Um, right, so that's that bit. Yeah, and make sure the wires come out a particular direction. These have got, they don't, they're not pre-wired as such, they have sockets, which is quite nice. Which is a bit easier to replace. So that goes on there that way. Like that. And then we put the bolts with the washers. Through straight into the motors, into the motor. not a lot of uh, thread left right so now I want a 2.5 millimeter uh, Alan's Alan uh, a hexagonal drive 2.5 millimeters it's an M3 so they usually half a millimeter smaller he says, thinking it's half a millimetre smaller, we shall find out. Yeah, that's a perfect fit. So we just screw that into the motor. We don't need to crank it down at the moment, just reasonably tight. Nakamui, good evening. Welcome to the studio this evening. How are you? <laughs> Thank you very much for that comment. Uh, it's going in the hole, isn't it? Uh, come on. No, it's not going in the hole at all because there's a too big a gap there. Oh, that's okay, All right. There we go, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for watching that movie. nice of you to do so. If nobody ever watched I will probably get tired of streaming after a while so <laughs> um, you are the reason why I'm streaming. Um, okay so the next thing we've got to do, what are you making this time? Uh, this is another part of the 3D printer so this is the x-axis carriage so a 3D printer prints in three dimensions um, generally speaking. Um, I think they all tend to use the same one. So Y direction is this way, backwards and forwards. 
X direction is left and right and the Z direction or Z um, is uh, vertically up and down. So this is the this carries the X axis carriage. So the carriage is what will carry the printer head uh, in this particular case. It sits on here vertically and slides left to right and this is this then is the Z carriage itself so this then moves up and down so I am currently making the Z axis carriage which carries the X axis so this is the X axis motor it gets confusing <laughs> uh, what will I be able to print um, I won't say anything but uh, quite a lot of things in principle there's quite it's the uh, the build the build volume is sorry I'm using this just because it's it is about that size um, in, so this is an A4 piece of wood so about A4 dam uh, sheet of wood in terms of the build volume and then up to probably what about eight to ten inches I don't know the exact height uh, off the top of my head so something that anything that will fit in there that um, the materials are suitable for printing really I suppose that's um, and it's kind of a, um, a a wide open sort of area so what sort of thing am I going to print with it no kind of sure I mean one of the things I want to want it to play about with is is vases tiki vases so sculpting things uh, like faces on vases and uh, but it's not really got enough um, height to do that I kind of would need a 3d delta printer for something like that but uh, I also want to try and uh, do some parts for some of the radio control models one of, the, one of the models I want to be able to make at some point is a bus and that's going to need panels it's going to need the, the front bumpers the light clusters these sorts of things so being able to maybe print those uh, in with a printer mainly because you can't buy them um, or not that I'm aware of and I'm, I'm assuming to be really expensive so something like that I'd be able to print those as well but I do things like, um, I, I don't know, I've got here I mean, this, is, this is a box lid, it's a box lid, it's not a box, it's a box lid uh, which has got a couple of speakers in the top, this is for a doorbell or the sounder for a doorbell um, being able to print those out perhaps with these you know, captive uh, positions for these to sit captive um, because if you try and um, try and you know these these are on the surface of this uh, lid box because it's really hard to do neat round holes and not leave gaps whereas if you print it you can do yeah because the printer is a lot better at making round circles than I'm at filing them um, and I suppose I could get a, a big hole cut and perhaps manage to have done that but uh, and then with enough time I can I can file nice round holes but I've got better things to do <laughs> um, so just being able to do something like that and then the box underneath uh, you know maybe put uh, things like the mount uh, create a box to go underneath with mount points in it for example to carry the the uh, Wi-Fi module that's going to sit in this box uh, and the control processor and the battery and that sort of thing um, rather than sort of trying to put the, mount them on breadboards and you know get them to fit just inside the box and cut the breadboard and you know then then try and mount the breadboard within it, it gets a bit it would be nice just to be able to sit down design a box and you know, everything just clips into place and job done so it's mainly that but to be honest it's I just wanted one <laughs> I wanted to play with one. Um, I mean, this, this is a kit now, which is uh, two, three years old, I think. I got it that long ago. I just never had the time to, uh, or the place, the space to put it together. Um, and having, not only having the space to put it together, but it's quite a large. 
I'm, I'm saying it's quite a large object when it's done. It is quite a large object when it's done. I mean, it's about half the size of the, you know, it sits in this area that you can see here, but it's not small. Um, and so you, I need it space to put that. So this has been barely the first opportunity to do it. Have I got something on that rod? Do you need to be clean to these rods? So, um, what sort of thing would you like to see done on a 3D printer? I mean, I, I, I am interested also in playing about, and I'm not sure whether this printer will actually do it, but some of the other materials you can get. Uh, you know, the general ones are ABS plastic or PLA plastic. PLA being a nicer one to print in, in a house, it doesn't smell. Or it does smell, but not. it smells nicer than ABS. But there are uh, um, quite a few filaments which have things got like wood fibres embedded in them, or, or bronze powder and these sorts of things. So, you know, I could potentially print something out uh, with a wood fibre uh, filament that looks like it's been carved out of wood. I understand you potentially can apply pyrography to it as well afterwards, although it's still embedded in plastic, so the plastic does tend to melt as well, but it might be something to play about with. Um, relief carving, as you know, is something that I do, and it might be interesting to try and print a relief carving, for example. <laughs> See what it looks like. Oh, no, no, I'm just, uh, just ideas and just playing around with things. So our next thing is an N, uh, Z end stop adjuster, which requires me to have an M3 nut, uh, an M3 sorry a 15 by 4 millimeter spring, two washers, and an M3 25 cap screw. Okay. Well, they happen to be out, so that's good. So I have one of these. I'm also kind of interested in print. Whilst I can do it with this printer, I am interested in printing multicolour objects as well, multiple using multicolour filaments. And uh, this printer will do it in that I actually have three extruders for it, so I can print in three colours. The only problem is with these sorts of printers, when you with three heads and three extruders, is that. You get one extruder, let's say here, your next extruder sits next to it like this, and your third one sits next to it. Now they're wider than this. But wh what that means is that when you fit three extruders to it, one of the first things that happens is you reduce your build volume because now this, this extruder, if it moves all the way to the left there, this is as close as this extruder can get to the end. So that's that's the first point at which you can start printing multiple colour. And when you go all the way to the other end, you get the same thing but in reverse. This extruder now is can't get to the end, it can only get here. So I've now reduced my build volume by let's say a couple of inches. And with three print heads, and as you can imagine it's it's down here, so it's got a lot smaller. Uh, and one of the other problems with three extruders, three print heads, is they have to be aligned. They have to be aligned exactly in the vertical direction, so they're all exactly parallel to the build plate. They also have to be aligned in this direction, so they're all exactly in a line. <laughs> and then once you've got them aligned in that direction, and in the vertical direction, um, then you should print it okay. So it's quite complicated. Um, I'm actually, what I, what I almost did instead of building this, and I got these out to do was was uh, was buy one of the Fuchsia M3 i3 printers, and the uh, well I suppose potentially I could do what he's done on there on this, but um, one of the things that he has for that is a set of electronics and a print head and top so I might just buy one to add on to it we'll see anyway which takes four filaments but it's it's it, it feeds them into one print head 
So there's no aligning to do at all. It just you know it puts the filament in, takes it out, puts another one in, takes it out. So you can do four colours or four different materials. That's really interesting because there, there is no alignment issues with that at all. That's um, how many hours did it take to build one? Depends how much talking you're doing, I guess. Uh, they all differ. Um, depends on how good the instructions are. This one probably will take about 10 hours, a couple of days type of thing uh, to build. Um, some of the new ones uh, that you can get kits, uh, you know, you can probably build them in about five, six hours. Yeah, because you know things like the carriages are already more or less already assembled and that sort of thing just because of they're like made out of pressed metal uh, and so you know there's no alignment to do we I've spent quite a bit of time aligning and measuring and and adjusting to get to get the frames to be square um, to, you know rods to be vertical and parallel to each other and these sorts of things because the, the more care I take about that the better the quality I'm going to get the newer printers are almost well things when they use instead of instead of using you know threaded rod they'll use sort of a, a folded metal sheet which can't twist and it can't misalign and it's it's so all that works taken out for you it's already done and so it's a lot quicker to build how much did this one um this one was about uk pounds so it's probably about 600 pounds six 600 700 pound I can't actually remember because they were I think it was about 650 UK pounds that's probably about eight hundred dollars I think somewhere in that sort of region uh, at the time with the three print heads so it would have been cheaper if it only bought the single print head these days um, the Pusha i3 is about 650 euros I think off the top of my head uh, and there's about another, if you want the multi um, the add-on for them for the multi filament printing that adds about another 350 euros um, but it's sort of whilst I'm not an expert about them I know very little about them it does seem to be one of the better printers you know the reviews that you see of them are of those are um, there's not exactly any bad reviews about them at all. It's, you know, they're all positive reviews. He obviously is a leader in the field of 3D printers and the techniques and stuff like that. Uh, and he does seem to make things really easy to do. Because you can buy them ready build. Um, Ult uh, Ultimaker, for example, is one. They're about a similar sort of price as well. You don't really get much uh, you don't really get them much cheaper from building it yourself you know they when they're selling them ready-made or, or mostly made of course they're in, employing economies of scale to buy and build things so their prices are less than the kits potentially are um, but even now I'd be more interested in building a kit just because I get a better understanding of how it works how it goes together and if I need to repair it I don't have to send it back. I can just you know look at it and go, ah, I know how that works and how it's supposed to work, and I can just you know fix the bits. But um, they're not cheap. They're not cheap. It is you know to some extent they are they are a gimmick. But if you're sort of looking to see what sort of things can be printed on a three on on this sort of three D printer, which is filament, FDM filament. I can't actually remember what the FDM stands for, but it's um, FDM is is the taking plastic, melting it, and squishing it out of a nozzle. There are other types of 3D printing, um, metal sintering, and uh, others that I can't and, and uh, resin printing, uh, which produce different qualities. They're more expensive, um, but if you look on on a website, something like Thingiverse they have 3d models available for people to download and use to print themselves you can find thousands of things there everything from a star trek phaser 
to um, you know 3D representations of 4D objects in five dimensional space uh, yeah very esoteric things like that so you know there's a heck of a lot of stuff out there uh, to play about with um, I would say also the filament itself isn't fantastically cheap it's not fantastically expensive but it's not you know you could add that to the price you're not, you're not just buying the printer once you bought the printer you then have to buy the filament um, and you know keep buying the materials and it takes I understand it takes a lot of practice in terms of understanding how to set it up before you are less likely to waste filament because something you know a 3d print even something that's relatively smallish like one of these for example could take several hours to print and you you know you could get to the point where because of something that you haven't done right you might be on the last few layers and um, something happens and they don't stick or they miss a line and then you've got to throw the print away that you've just done and start again so you know it's um, it's going to be interesting shall we say I want the spring that's what I'm looking for now so where's the spring likely to be any indications of which bag the spring might be in not that bag anyway so I've now got to go hunt ah I see springs so in here I'm looking for a 15 by 4 millimeter that's one in a bag it's the smallest spring in there so that should make it easier to find I suppose what I will be doing when I when this when <laughs> there's optimism for you when this printer works they even give you the clips to hold the glass down <laughs> um, one of the first things I will be printing when this printer is capable of being printed is going to be a set of the all the plastic printed parts uh, so that got spares in case they break because that is that is one of the principles of that they started 3d the 3d printers with is and that's you know they, they these things like the web wraps they are in principle the, the the design principle was that they ought to be able to print themselves uh, now they can't quite do that I mean there's a lot of metal in here the motors etc um, there are people that are doing work on being able to 3d print metal um, in the home as opposed to in, in manufacturing where they can 3d print metal but um, you yeah, know they are that was the idea uh, of being able to you know a machine will print itself it re will replicate itself that's the rep wrap um, replicating I can't remember what it stands for but, but the rep bit is the replicating so it replicates itself um, they kicked it and the washer and insert them in the spring into the washer into the opposite with the washer on that piece in there Okay, and I want a nut. I want an M3 nut. Which is something I didn't notice the requirement for. They look like M3s, yep. So that's going to go into the, into here with the sound, right? So that's this is supposed to be the end stop adjuster. So I'm not quite sure how it's going to adjust the end stop, but we will see in future, I guess. So I want one of these. I want a washout. Put the 
spring on it, put another washer on it I believe. Less than that. Right, take the M3 washer and set them into the spring with the washer on the upper side. This assembly inserts into a small hole on the X mount access by the bottom clip. Oh, down there! Right. Oh, I understand. I thought it went in here. It doesn't. There's a hole down there. I'm trying to do that without that. <laughs> Uh, uh, pinging off, so I push that through there. Um, actually, I don't need to push it through there. I can, in theory, just hold a nut there and uh, screw this up. But of course, given the fact that that nut's a, that's at an angle, I just push it through a little bit more, and then we can slip the nut back. Do it the easy way, push it through, screw it up by hand and then just let it, let it in theory drop back because there's, there's a, it's sort of a, a captive shape around there, it's shaped in theory for the nut to slip in and be held sort of captive. It's not doing that very well. There we go. And I gather that this is the top of this is it's or the bottom maybe is, is the actual probably the bottom. It will then press against the, uh, the end stop or the, the micro switch which will tell it where it is and you adjust it obviously by screwing this up or down. Right, so we've added that bit in, um, and it's it's tight enough for the minute. That's fine. And now we do the x-axis carriage. So that's not that x-axis carriage. I know what that looks like. And it's hidden right under everything on here. So there we go. This. I'm going to guess it sort of sits on top of there and like that. Uh, and we're going to need the belt. I can see this is going to be f sort of a fun thing here at this point. Firstly push the linear bearings, that's these things, into the slots here. Yeah, don't push them in the top, push them in the side because if you try and push them in the top you'll snap this. That's fair enough. Right, but which way round? Which way round? Because it can go that way, or it could go that way. Because all I'm seeing is, is a photograph of that section. There. And it doesn't tell me which way these things are. Let's see if we can see that on another picture. Okay, so with the motor that way, this is on. This is there like that. Okay. Now let's see if I. C Where's my pen? I just want this pen just to go backwards on the browser. My finger isn't tiny enough. Hit the back button. Um. Right, so yes. So what I do is slide this into position. So that one 
really just you know we'll just sit there and then we're going to slide that in there and this one in here as well like that and there we go that feels a bit rough but uh, maybe they're slightly out of alignment themselves but it's free enough so that's the carriage installed and now what we need to do is hit the end stop for the X direction which is that one and that I gather sits on the back of here so again an M, oh, an M2.5 screw this time and washer so this looks like it's going to be self tapping M2.5 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 washers that's the washers every time I put these away I always need to get them out don't I so I kind of could do with leaving them out but then they just get in get lost M2.5 by 16 that's that one right I do like to keep things neat. <laughs> you might not think so looking at the studio here, but I do like to keep things neat. So one of these. One of the washers and then I need the limit switch, which is a micro switch. switch micro switch in here so stuff isn't terribly hard to find in the bags which is good and they are labeled which also makes it easy Then I've got one of these very nice instructions to follow that doesn't really make sense. So insert the insert the the bolt into the hole nearest the oh nearest the button. Ah that makes more sense when I actually read what it said as opposed to what I thought it said. I thought it said near it's the bottom and I'm thinking this is the bottom and those two holes are identical but it says button and the button's in there it's what this lever presses down on so it actually means that one now that's clear helps when you read what it actually says as opposed to what you think it says which is really interesting because that's kind of the sort of the way in which you have to do a lot of art you paint, draw what you see, not what you think you see. Why is that not? Um, sorry, I just saw something over there on my um, uh, air stand. I've got just set over there. I've got it. I'll show you what I've got set over there. That one's filing. This is this is a um, air control unit. So when I um, when I'm doing things like the using the dental drill or for uh, for engraving, or I'm doing airbrushing and uh, using the big compressor. Um, I'll I'll stick air into the back into the bottom of here, and all of this pipe work does two things. You've got I've got two feeds of uh, air pressure, so I can adjust the air pressure, and there's an air dryer here. Um, so this extracts any moisture and dust. That's got into the pipe work between the compressor and here. There's another one of these on the compressor. 
Um, so in theory this should never have anything in it but it's there just in case because if you get more to get oil or, or water into things like the dental drill or even into the airbrush um, it, it can seriously damage the turbine on the on the uh, dental drill or it can ruin any <laughs> painting if you spray oil all over all over it and of course the paint won't stick then but this is um, so this, that's what I was looking at and I just saw out of the corner of my eye I saw this knot down here but it looks sort of gold and I'm thinking what's that over there because it was just catching my eye but this is uh, this is also set up to allow me to connect a foot pedal so when I'm using the dental drill um, I can connect it uh, connect a foot pedal up which then feeds air uh, regulated air I can adjust the pressure um, out of this nozzle so that uh, I can use a foot pedal just like a dentist does actually to vary the speed of the drill it's really useful when you're engraving or carving for that matter because you can wood carve the same way now I need to expand that hole a little bit this is one of those things where I could have should have remembered to bring the uh, um, bum, bum, bum. a drill in I could then just have, have simply run a drill through this and uh, done the same job I'm doing now in about four seconds flat. So I'm just uh, expanding the hole slightly. I want that nut to go through reasonably, well the bolt sorry not the nut, to go through reasonably smoothly. I don't want to cut a thread in there or distort the plastic of this uh, this switch to push it through because then I'm likely to cause the switch to fail prematurely this is one of those things that in a factory what they'd probably do is just press that through using a you know press and uh, which would distort the switch body but by doing it myself I can go you know what I would prefer just to expand that slightly so I don't have to press it through so this is probably making the canvas um, shake a little bit Is that enough? I, I just want to ex it just expand it enough just so it will actually go through without too much effort. There we go. And right, this thing gets fit in here. The, uh, there, I guess, gets screwed into. The back of the motor there. Now what I should have done, and I'll do it first now, is just take that back out of there. And rather than trying to do that with the micro switch on, I'm also going to make the hole just a tiny bit round for a start. <laughs> As I, you know, it's squished. It's squished with it because that's the, the the part that was on the bed so that hole is squished and I just want to get it started and, and, and cut an initial thread so what I should do here is perhaps use like a countersink bit um, or but or, I mean a drill would do the same a twist drill would do the same thing but I'm just sort of making that top very slightly larger just so that this actually gets goes in slightly it got you know uh, it, it gets a bite with you know uh, rather than me trying to it's halfway in the hole is what I'm trying to say it's a little bit in that makes it easier for it to uh, 
to cut a thread because it's already ha halfway through there and it's not literally halfway in the hole but it is why have I got that for 2.5 that's a 2 that doesn't fit and that's a th Hmm. Oh, right. <laughs> you know what? It helps a great deal if you... This is a really nice toolkit. But I was using the... I keep forgetting that the... Um, the labelling is above the bit, not below it. My tendency is to read the ones below it. So I was reading that as two millimeters. This is 2.5. It's actually, this is two point. That's metric. Uh, sorry, that's imperial. This is metric, which explains why that one wouldn't fit because <laughs> it's this one I wanted. Yep, that fits. So now I can put that back in there and just gently screw that in because it had that start. It was it, it was made it easier to cut its thread, so I don't need to go all the way down. Just enough to create an addition, an initial thread. And by not having the micro switch there, I was able to do that. It was made it a bit easier because I could hold the hold the bolt in position without having to worry about potentially damaging this by you know, pressure in some angle or something like that. And this is where you tend to wish you've got a, a powered screwdriver of some kind uh, because this is going to take a little few minutes anyway just a few moments just to get down here now i'm sure this is one of the things that i probably will wish i had um, put the white soldered the wires onto first i may you know maybe one of those things that you you take off Put the wires on because trying to solder in that space there is going to be interesting not impossible but just interesting so that's there so that's the x-axis bit complete so we now do what they call the z-axis assembly which is putting this onto the machine itself I love this. They've just given me um, two photographs and said, um, "This is the photograph of what it should like look like." Except one of the rods is in the wrong place and one of the end <laughs> stops is in the wrong place. Yeah. Okay. So this is where we need two more motors. Lots of stepper motors. I lost the interesting things the stepper motors. Fun things to play with. Uh, printed couplings, that's these things. I gather, so anyway, looking at the picture. Nearly. I've got three that look like that and two that look like that. So obviously they're not. That's not uh, co completely correct. So I've got three that look like that and three that look like that. I'm supposed to have four couplings. Hmm. I'm missing something. Okay, I'm missing something. I've done something wrong.
Now nope, there's another coupling. So I've got four of those, so um, it needs four, so that's four. The last step had me. So the last thing said I needed the belt, but it didn't give me any instructions for mounting the belt. Oh, it did. There we go. Oh, I just missed that. All right, so before we do this bit, we'll add the belt. Uh... Cut off a small length of belt, approximately 80 millimeters long. The width of the X carriage and press this into the slot in the carriage with the teeth facing upwards. This fit is deliberately tight and you may need to use a small flat head screwdriver to push the belt into the slot. The belt should be pushed to the very back of the slot so that's basically going in there 80 millimeters. is almost exactly the length of that yeah which is what it said so per side cutters will do this job since i don't can't find don't know where the scalpel is for the moment here we go facing teeth facing upwards and we're gathering since that's going to go that way that must mean it goes in there And I can see what's going to happen with this. When we come to put the other belt in, the ends will go in here and the ends will sort of mesh together like this uh, and lock. Now, yeah, I don't happen to have a small flathead screwdriver lying about, but I do have the a, a bit for one. So I use this to make sure this is pushed all the way in. And the belt goes all the way to the back. bit thick to press down in the middle of that with. Have I got something? Okay what I'm doing is just looking in the back here and I can see where there's a in here I can see where there's a where there's a gap between the belt and the back. I can do the same thing by looking in here and there is a gap now it's it's been it's pivoting about something in there I need something that's thin enough just found my scalpel to go in there and my thinnest screwdriver blade doesn't because what I don't want to do is to sort of ram something in there which then pushes the plastic apart and um, it's meant to be a tight fit, I gather, so this doesn't pop out. So that's in, and that's in. So that looks like it. So that's the belt bit done for the minute. Apparently we don't put the other belt in until afterwards. Because I might get it wrong, apparently. I'm not quite sure why I get it wrong, but anyway. Um, we're doing what the instructions say. So we now want um, back to this section. Two motors. 
the four printed cup layers, 30 millimeter, these are the, yeah, so 30 millimeter plastic, which is these two things I gather. That one and that one. Some M3 washers. M3 washers. I need eight of these. One, two, three, four. This is as bad as doing the chainmail with counting again. Back to the counting. Five, six, seven, one more is eight. It's as bad as counting rings. Only there, at least I've got to, I learned to count up to 100 or more. Uh, here we're counting in smaller numbers, but never mind. Anybody out there wants to know anything about what's going on, obviously you are welcome to ask in chat. Say hello if you wish. Uh, this is a 3D printer we are building, as it probably says on the title if you happen to have read it. Um, although I don't always read the titles either. And what do, what do I want now? Some M3 nuts, which I've got here. Um, but this is kind of a one-off one activity. It's a few streams worth of one activity. I don't normally go around building 3D printers. This is uh, this is just to build this and then it, I won't be building another one, I don't think. Although I do have a very small laser cutter to build, uh, which I might do at some point. Um, some cap screws, two lots of cap screws. Okay, uh, normally I do 25, no. I do a lot of other different crafts, such as I'm going to write. I am, you know what? After this stream, I'm even going to make myself if I can find my pen. Uh, there's my pen. A scrap bit of paper. I'm actually going to write down because I, I always forget, and I'm going to do it on a different piece of paper. But I'm going to write down the crafts because I always forget one of them at least so we've got um, that chain mail here that's one of the things that we do so we make uh, jewelry um, chain mail being sort of generic for but this is chain mail technique of course but I do beading and uh, weaving and things like that so chain mail is, is our jewelry And this is so I remember because I'm, uh, even now I'm just very quickly thinking through in my own mind what I do. And we, we've got uh, we've got carving, which is relief carving. So that's sort of small, smallish. How do you describe three D uh, relief carving as opposed to three D carving? Three D carving is a full three D object. Relief carving is kind of the object stuck to a board, so you carve kind of half of it. But I do that with chisels, very sharp chisels, and at some point I'll connect up the pneumatic and the uh, electric tools, and we can do some electric carving as well. Uh, we've got, as well as that, we've got scraper board. My, I know my handwriting isn't very good, and you probably can't even see it, but I can see it here at least. That's one useful thing about these glasses. Scraper board, it's an art form, is that as opposed to carving, which is a craft maybe. But uh, scraper board is a piece of cardboard basically, covered in usually china clay, but sometimes it'll be metal foil like gold foil or silver foil. Then covered with a layer of Indian ink, and then use sharp tools like pointy things like this or scalpels or even things that look like pen nibs to scratch away the black leaving the gold or the white behind and that's how you form your picture black and white monochrome image 
Uh, so we've got that. We also have pyrography. Which is, uh, I describe as painting with heat. So that's using a, a heated tool. Wood burning. Although wood doesn't burn. Uh, wood does burn. It doesn't burn wood. <laughs> doesn't get hot enough to burn wood it's kind of a cooking type of process um, I suppose you might get close enough to coming out with charcoal at the end of it rather than burnt wood but mm. uh, so pyrography is something that we do as well and there is something also called punch craft which is uh, it's a technique which actually is very similar to the way in which rugs are made so they make, uh, but they do it on very small pieces of material, but it's using a, a particular type of needle to push thread through from the back, leaving a loop on the front. And you create an image using different colored walls and create a textured image by making them different lengths. And so, you know, that's one, one of the art forms. It, Punchcraft is a trade name, but it's uh, it is a rug. It's a technique by which rugs are made. I do actually do rugs, but not on stream at the moment. I will do at some point, don't see any reason why not. It's a relatively slow thing to do on stream. It takes an hour to do two rows usually. Um, and that's probably a, a couple of a hundred knots that take place to do that. And so that's for, there is another one that I've just started doing um, in this odd moments, which is magic dots. Magic, yeah, dots, which is, um, kind of a generic name for something called diamond dots which is the trade name so magic dots is a is kind of a, a rip-off but that's little tiny faceted pieces of plastic which are stuck to a uh, get stuck to, onto a material to form an image so one two three four five six things effectively now that I get done on stream in uh, as a reasonably regular thing regular I'm currently streaming about once or twice a week, so not that regular, but you know, relatively regular. So now I've got that, which I'll copy onto a proper piece of paper and put it over there somewhere so that I keep remembering that. But I'm going to put that just over there for the moment. Right, four nuts, M3 screw, uh, cap head screws. Okay. So with these things, the M means metric. The three refers to three millimeter, which is usually the uh, thread diameter. And then the cap head refers to this sort of square square top with a, with a hexagonal hole in the middle, which you then use a, a hexagonal wrench, a hex wrench, or otherwise known as an Allen key. But an Allen key is a trade name. So, in theory, you should only use an Allen key if it's come from the Allen company. Um, everybody else then. It's like Hoovers. That's a trade name. But everybody calls them Hoovers. They're actually a vacuum cleaner. Uh, I'm looking for 20 and 10 millimeter. So somewhere around in here. There's the twenties. I wonder where the tens were then. Must have missed that. Uh, I want four of these. That's one. Counting again, you see. Two, three. I think there's only kind of like the carve, carving it for well, I don't know, the art forms. Carving pyrography scraper board. I'm cheating now. Now that I can see them, I'll probably mention them quite a bit. Um, I don't have to count them <laughs> when I'm doing that. Uh, that's a 16mm. I want 10mm. They should be in here somewhere. There we go, I missed them. There's one, two, three, two, four, there's five in there, okay. Quickest way to get four out when there's only five in the bag. Tip the lot out and put one back. That was always, that's the, that technique of, yeah. Take them all out and add one back. Yeah kind of something that I, I learned a long, long time ago when I was still at school. I didn't learn it at school, I learned it in a supermarket, and it's where I used to work, my second job. 
um, that I ever had was working in a supermarket and I did stock taking there and you will learn to do things like counting 48 48 96 can't do it anymore but one of the things you can do with that is if you learn certain tricks you can do really quick mental maths so counting in 48 counting 50s and subtract 2 so 50 is 48 100 minus 4 is 96 150 minus 12 is 138 and you can then go fairly quickly like that so you can count things and usually what you do is you go so like five boxes of 48 so that's five times 50 250 minus 10 240 um do you learn to count that by the way 48 is 48 tins which is cat food or dog food they can be for or came in 48 tin boxes so you learned all sorts of silly tricks like that really how to count things fairly quickly um what am i doing now i've got the got everything out so we start by fitting the couplings to the motors right so that's putting that over the top of the shaft probably with a bit of space now i know I, the the reason that this is this is a flexible coupling that's why it's 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 um, a tube plastic uh, tube like this that bends so if this is not perfectly aligned with the, the shaft it's going to drive you know, if it's bent slightly this will take up the bend rather than jamming up the motor or jamming up the dry uh, jam, jamming up the rod that's driving or the bearings so this is a flexible coupling it's a cheap flexible coupling but it's one that works it's actually used um, the, you know it's it's an engineering fix it's not a cheap cheap one it's it's a good engineering type thing they do use them in really big um, systems so um, okay so and what I've got to do is find where the flat is on the motor there because when I fit this over the tube I've got to put this so that the hole here is where the flat of the motor is now this is only going to need to be on enough to carry that and I said the flat was there so I will slide that actually what I'm going to do before I slide that is I'm going to file it again it's, uh, you know these things were printed like this the bottom layer is squished it's got a lip on it and it's got a lip inside and I can see that lip which isn't isn't well it's not sharp but it's not blunt either I can see that cutting into there and creating a, a cut making a weak point so what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to file that off it doesn't say to do this and it may be the wrong thing to do they may be in intending that to cut into there but they don't say so I'm making a modification that's potentially one of the first things I print out is going to be a set of parts if I've really done this wrong well then I'll be able to print another one This isn't particular. Oh, in theory, I guess shouldn't be a really high torque thing, so um, it shouldn't need sort of the what would normally be a diff, uh, the this type of um, universal joint. No. All right. Do that and then pull you backwards. Okay. Uh, we'll get there in the end right so then which washer which nut is it well which one is it? it's a 20 millimeter that's one of those with a washer with a washer this is as bad as, as the rings in in um, chain mail 
Uh, you try and put a wash on and it could be pink somewhere and you've got to go find it. Now in this side here there's a captive nut. So I'm just going to see if I can push that in before I try and screw it up. There we go. Uh, that should, if I put the right end on. Because this is an M3 so it needs a 25 millimeter hex head. Okay. Captive nut means I don't need a spanner and I can just tighten that up. No particular sort of how tight to make it so that will do. And then we put one on the other end as well but don't tighten that one up so I'm going to file this as well. Okay, that's enough for that. Put that over there. He says enough and then promptly files again. That's because I missed a bit. Actually, just on the shoulder here, which is actually quite a hard place to hit. You know something? You are going to go on there. I'm sure if I do the same thing as I do with rings, which is talk to them, it will do what I want in the end. There we go. And then I do the same thing, just put this through, but I don't bother tightening it up too much because I'll need to, it'll need to go on to whatever it is that it's uh, going to drive. Put the nut in. We, even though this is a um, universal drive or a flexible drive you really still want if you can want to align them as close as possible because you do put stress on the coupling if it's not uh, perfectly aligned and over time this the this you know the bending of this the continuous bending as it rotates will eventually cause it to deteriorate and you'll need to replace it but um, the more accurately you can align it, the less it moves. So again, it's one of those things that um, yeah, potentially just reduces the failure chances if you spend the time to align things properly. I'm sure I do the same thing now with the other one. Yes, I do. So that goes on there and push it all the way down for the minute because when I try and push this clip on it will go down anyway. File the clip. Which if nothing else makes it easier to go on because this end of the hole is smaller than the other end. So I'm not using a round file here, I'm using sort of a, an oval file. The reason for that is it's easier to file round holes <laughs> uh, with one of these than a round file. Daft as it sounds. And that's because of the shape. You, with a round file you tend to cut grooves. And it's really hard to take the point off. Um, and yet if you, uh, if you use one of these semi-rounds or oval shaped ones it doesn't uh, create that as much of a valley or a peak so it's a, it's a lot easier to actually file those peaks down with one of these than it is with an actual round round file so we push that over the top of there we'll push it down and then pull it back and find where the The D is, so the flat, because that goes in between these two apparently. 
That is almost certainly so that the this cl the clamp, which is round, of course, gets the most pressure uh, on the on the motor shaft, which it wouldn't be able to do if it was uh, if the deep the flat was in somewhere in there. That would be a whole area that didn't get any pressure on it. And I guess I could have filed this hole just to make this going easier, but. It's not that far off. I could there. I'm gonna say I could push it through. But... Okay. Make sure that's pushed in. Mm -hmm. Screw the nut. Screw the bolt into it, and this one will screw up reasonably tightly. I guess what we'll do is we'll probably see how much it, or if it indeed slips, and if it does slip, then we'll tighten it up a bit more. File this one, and then we put this on the other end of that tube. <laughs> Told you it was like chainmail with things trying to escape. I'm just filing the lips. I'm holding this not pa not exactly parallel. Um, I don't want to file the actual inside of the clip itself. Just that first layer, and that slips over the top of that. And then it looks like we actually mount them. The frame. Okay, so we will actually mount these to the frame, but that will be the last thing that we're going to do tonight on this. So let me just put these to one side so I can get the frame in. So this is one of the, one of the important steps. So um, I can't get them both in, I don't think, but what we'll do is probably do one and then spin it around. So, in particular, where is it suggesting that I put the wires? That way. So, it will go in there and one on the other side. So, what I'm going to try and do is do this upside down. So although you can actually see what I'm doing and just offering up a, a bolt underneath trying to guess where the hole is in the motor and get the, the nut to align with it there and then I'll screw that up not going to make it too tight at this point in time. One of the reasons being is uh, I've got to get this other nut in and if I tighten that one up and this is just the motor's just twisted slightly it will probably be impossible to get this second one in because you need to sort of twiddle it and uh, if I tighten it up and I can't do that then I can spend hours trying to get this in and I'd never do it. I think that's right. Once I've got two in there, uh, then I can go ahead and just uh, nip them up. I'm not going to make them too tight at this stage. It doesn't say whether I should or not, 
but I think the next thing that's going to go in after this at some point is the drive rod which is a, a threaded rod again uh, but we'll put that you know, at that point I may need to adjust this a little bit it doesn't say so I'll turn that round so you can see what's going on so I take a take a, 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 a bolt the washer on it and then I feed it up through one of these two little holes here like that and then that goes into one of these two uh, the two diagonal holes on the motor Which luckily that went in first time Okay, that's a bolt that tries to escape. Why is that loose? That's not supposed to be loose. I shall have to, yeah, it looks like I'm going to have to go and make sure all the bolts and things are tight on this thing. All the nuts are tight. That shouldn't have been loose on that threaded rod there. Don't know why it was. It means I'm going to have to check the alignment at some point. Uh, now I'm trying to do this by guesswork as to where that slot is. It's there. And now I've got to find the nut by guesswork. Sorry, the nut, the hole in the motor. Now oh, there you go. We needed adjusting, and it's slotted into place. So I'll screw that up. So this is just a little. Well, a little tight and just to stop the nuts coming loose right so there we go it's now 10 past 9 in the UK and I think I do is say yeah uh, switch to that camera and say I think that's going to be it for tonight um, how long has it been this has probably been about an hour and three quarters something like that so a reasonable amount done actually I suppose but it doesn't seem much but we've got this carriage here the motor's been fitted the uh, end stop adjuster's been fitted this end um, stop switch has been fitted the carriage here has been fitted uh, ready this then will go at some point will go in here she goes on that side so it, it will go in there, in that sort of position. Which is really interesting, because... Although you're supposed to push the rods as far as possible into here, it does look like that's going to need to come be pushed out, because th these bits here, you can't see what I'm looking at. <laughs> Uh, I'm busy showing you what, I, what and you can't see it because you're looking at me. Um, these bits here sit on these on these rods, and when I do that, looking at it here now, there um, these these end pieces need to be pushed out in order to make the uh, them fit. Uh, I don't know if you can just see it there, but if I put this one in its correct position, this one is short by a good half inch. You can't see it. It's terrible with these big things trying to get uh, positioning of cameras. Take my word for it. So what I was saying is we fitted the motor, fitted this uh, this end stop adjuster, fitted the micro switch on the back, fitted this particular carriage on the belt lock in there. And oops, sorry about that. We've then assembled the two motor drives for the, for the Z axis and mounted them into the carriage. All of that's taken an hour and a half. Uh, plus me talking on top of that. So, doesn't seem like a lot of progress, but it's actually sort of moving along quite nicely. So let me switch back to that one. Oh dear. Got a nice easy control and I keep forgetting what it is I'm looking at. I could do with a monitor in front of me that's showing me the broadcast image. I could do that I suppose might think about that for later but anyway what I was going to do now is say thank you everybody that's been watching of course if you have been watching it would be fantastic if you would be following me if you're not already push the follow button you will get to hopefully be notified when I 
go live next time. I'm going to try and do some more tomorrow night. Whether it'll be some more of the printer or whether it's something else, I'm not sure yet. Well, depend on how I feel tomorrow. I don't want to do this if I'm not feeling like I want to do it because it's got to be aligned properly. And if I'm not feeling like I want to do it and I'm a bit slapdash about it, I'm just going to have to do it again anyway. Uh, and at worst, I could damage a part. So uh, we will see how it goes, but it's coming along nicely. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. It's at Zeraganart. I do tweet when I go live, which may be more reliable than uh, than Twitch. May not, <laughs> but I do tweet, and occasionally I'll tweet some other things that's of interest uh, with regard to the stream or you know things like that. So keep an eye out for Zeraganart on YouTube as well. I will shortly start uploading some of the historic videos that were recorded on Twitch. So if you want to look at any of the past uh, streams, which um, Twitch no longer have an archive for, then they will, or well, most of them at least, will then be going up onto, uh, onto YouTube starting now in March 2016. That's when I started, back in March 2016. Um, or even earlier. That's the first ones that are going up anyway. First time I started recording it, I think. But anyway, uh, yes. That's it for tonight. I'm going to waffle on otherwise. Shows I'm getting tired. Thank you all for watching. Hope to see you on the next stream. And bye for now.